Now, have you ever wanted to own your own AI cloud? You can. Let's talk about it. Well, welcome back to the Cloud Computing Insider, where we talk about the realities of cloud computing and generative AI and other platforms and how to make them work for your enterprise. I'm your host, David Linthicum, author, speaker, B-List geek. Let's get started. So this is going to be a bit different because I'm talking about a particular product space and actually looking at products in that space. So normally we talk about concepts and we talk about news, uh, things like that. But I did get a lot of requests uh, that this be covered uh, because lots of enterprises out there are moving into generative AI rather quickly. Uh, they see AI private clouds as perhaps a good option for them, and they're trying to get some opinions on, on what's out there. So I thought I took a look at the concept. I've been uh, looking at it grow uh, for the last couple, three years, uh, looking at different product sets, things like that, going to conferences. And I'll give you my take on it and uh, how you should consider it. So keep in mind that this is a teaching video. It's not a product comparison video. <laughs> the reason I don't do product video, uh, product comparison videos is they're a lot more work. Uh, you have to do the demos, and really, if you're going to do them properly, uh, common benchmarking, common feature function analysis, things like that, that are a bit more um, time-consuming to do. So I'm not being compensated for this. So this is going to be my opinion and I do urge you to do your own research before selecting any of these. So my opinion is my opinion. Uh, that shouldn't be the end word. And so, again, your particular requirements are going to be different than other people's requirements. We'll get into that later in the video. So make sure you do your own homework. And it's going to be very important. You pick the wrong product. This is going to be very expensive to undo later. So ultimately, uh, not a product comparison. And... Um, one of the reasons I don't do it is, I mean, I've been doing product comparisons, uh, you know, back in the early part of my career, um, and they're just a lot of work, and you have to go through um, AR analyst relations and, and press relations uh, people uh, to get to the people you need to talk to to analyze the product and get the demos and things like that. Uh, so it's just become kind of too much trouble uh, than the outcome that comes from this, at least at least in my world. So. Uh, let me know in your comments if you want more content like this, or if it was a bust, I'm happy to hear that too. I'm still learning about the YouTubes. So what is a private AI cloud? Um, well, first and foremost, these things, private clouds in general, have a tendency to be uh, more marketing uh, bundles than anything else. And so what happened, and certainly back in the day when cloud computing started to catch, uh, you know, catch fire, uh, every hardware company out there uh, decided to get in the cloud space by taking the path of least resistance and basically declaring that everything they deployed on on prem was a cloud, <laughs> it was a private cloud, because that was part of the stuff. NIST defined a private cloud as something that's going to be owned infrastructure. Uh, it's not shared with anybody else, and it can leverage some of the same characteristics you're able to find in in public cloud providers: the ability to uh, self provision, your ability. Uh, to dynamically change things, all these sorts of things. And of course, they were all over the place in the features and functions that they offered. Sometimes it was a huge stretch to call them a cloud. And I think back then I called them out on that. Um, but certainly private clouds, you know, has a role um, and they are playing a role within AI uh, simply because, you know, public clouds are normally going to be the path of least resistance because they're able to provide you with an AI development and deployment and tuning ecosystem directly within the cloud provider. You just press a button and they're allocated to you. So this is in essence replicating that on-prem. So in other words, we're able to get a complete ecosystem, which is bundled with the hardware that someone drops off at your loading dock. You bring it into your data center, set it up, and you should have an environment that's gonna provide you with all the tooling and infrastructure you need to build, deploy, train models, you know, do all the things you need to do with building AI applications, including generative AI applications. So that's what they are at the end of the day. So they're dedicated environments. You own them. That's the big difference. Uh, and they're able to develop, deploy, manage artificial intelligence and AI app services. And they're able to provide their own security infrastructure, governance infrastructure, data management infrastructure. And they're different from public AI clouds, which provide shared resources over the internet. Uh, private AI cloud um, offers controls over data, privacy, security, and compliance. So people are paranoid about putting their data on the public cloud and also paranoid about putting their knowledge models on the public cloud. 
uh, this is an option for them. So you can keep it on your own hardware, keep it in your own data center, uh, keep everything under lock and key. And many enterprises are more comfortable with that. And there's some good reasons to consider it and also some reasons where that may be a bit paranoid. We're not going to talk about that in this video, but consider that as well, that private cloud options are there or the ability to configure a bespoke uh, you know, set of hardware that you configure yourself uh, on-prem is also an option. And obviously AI is gonna run all over the place, agentic AI systems in a distributed fashion. We can deploy them on heterogeneous environments. Just the sky's the limit in terms of the platforms you're able to choose. But we're gonna look at the, uh, the private AI cloud pr uh, platform option here uh, in terms of what the advantages are and who the players are out there. So let's get going. So what do these private AI clouds have in common? Well, number one, on-premise deployment. Um, on-premises deployment, excuse me. Private AI clouds are housed within the data center. We own the hardware, already talked about that, so nobody else is able to use it. They're not shared resources. These are dedicated to you. These are dedicated resources. Um, if you have heightened measures of security and compliance or you're just paranoid about putting your data on a public cloud provider, um, and th let, that's, like I said, another discussion, uh, private, private AI clouds may be a better option for these particular use cases. They're customizable solutions. They allow some customization in terms of tailoring the, the configuration for your specific need. You're able to select the hardware software configuration options. You have better control over data. Again, you retain full ownership and control over the platforms, which means the data that's on those platforms. However, we could end up with some situations, and I think many AI systems are gonna run into this uh, problem, where we're going to need training data that comes from outside the organization, uh, you know, on a server that's accessible over the open internet, the ability to get to cloud resources, we may have moved some data into the cloud, and the ability to reach out to other platforms uh, to communicate with the data engine to get data that you need for training. So all that, all that stuff doesn't go away. You still have the same complexity in building these AI systems. And obviously I'm teaching a, a generative AI architecture program now half of the last year, and we're going through all that. And it's a more complex and more involved process, and it can be more expensive as well. Uh, scalability, uh, private clouds claim to be designed for scalability, very much like the public cloud providers. Of course, you're going to be only be able to scale up to the amount of hardware that you own. So you can't I suddenly start to scale up and, you know, magically uh, uh, servers appear in your data center. Uh, it's different than a public cloud provider where you're, in essence, able to allocate as many resources you need to support uh, the processing. And of course, integrated AI tools, the environments, you know, um, you know, they provide all of the systems you need for the machine learning platforms, which is core to generative AI, data storage, processing capabilities, facilitating into AI life cycles, even your ability to have foundational models, you know, things like ChatGPT or a version of that uh, that you're able to deploy on these systems. So it provides you with a pretty good ecosystem. Generally speaking, it's going to be vary depending on the cloud, on the uh, technology providers to get into AI and not have to be a complete uh, you know, AI geek and understanding how all these things are going to work and play well together. You can buy the bundle. They'll set it down for you, get it up and running, and hopefully it's going to meet your AI needs. So who is this for? Well, enterprises that have particular use cases like data intensive applications um, where you're dealing with large volumes of sensitive data and you have to deal with compliance and regulations and it's easier to have that data very close to where it's going to be consumed. So in other words, if we're training our knowledge models based on massive amounts of data, uh, it's going to be much more difficult and there's going to be a lot more of a performance hit uh, in running it over the open internet to get to our cloud provider in the case of deploying it on the cloud. And so it's easier to move the data closer to where it's going to be consumed. That's kind of a law of architecture we've been dealing with for a long period of time, and it doesn't go away here. So large volumes of data, sensitive data, and the ability to get to the information that you need when you need it and do so in a way that's going to be a lot lower latency. Also, the other thing to remember is that uh, one of the junk fees in terms of leveraging public cloud providers is data ingress and egress. And so if you're pushing data onto the public cloud to train your AI system, for example, they're typically going to charge you for that. Not always, but they're typically going, you're typically going to get a big bill, and certainly if you move data off the platform as well. Custom AI development, they enable organizations to build uh, bespoke AI models for what exactly do you need. Of course, if they didn't do that, this would be absolutely worthless. Uh, and then hybrid models, they're able to allow you to mix and match 
uh, between on-prem and the public cloud. And you'll see, you know, when we get into looking at the systems, I'm only looking at uh, private AI clouds that support an on-prem only option. And most of them out there, and certainly if you could Google AI private clouds, you're going to see a vast amount of, of uh, products out there that claim to be that. And many of them are hybrid cloud deployments. In other words, they, they're, they're functionally dependent on uh, certain aspects of the system running in a cloud, even though they have on-premise deployments. And we have, uh, you know, obviously micro clouds and, you know, some of the other stuff the big cloud providers are providing. So it's, it's getting a little confusing then, but typically the ones we're going to look at here, which are able to be deployed on-prem only, at least based on the information I have, uh, are also able to leverage public cloud providers as needed. So you can leverage them to store your training data, uh, to even do some inference processing up there. And so you can deploy them or, or configure them as a truly hybrid cloud deployment option if you want to. But that may be diluting the reason that we're moving to a private AI cloud in the first place, but some organizations are going to find that helpful. So what's, what are the downsides, Dave? It's, uh, it's not all kittens and rainbows. No, it's not. Um, these offerings have a tendency to be more static than you would think. So while some of them are providing good configuration capabilities, in other words, you can configure them for the, the needs of your project, in many instances, uh, those, these systems are going to have to be, um, you take it or leave it. In other words, they're going to give you the configuration as far as doing some configuration of the tooling, that's certainly allowed and certainly possible. But as far as you switching some of the tooling out, uh, you need different data cleansing systems, different AI model tuning systems, you know, all the, the, the fun stuff that comes with building an AI system. And you don't find that particular product in the bundle that they offer you within your private AI cloud is going to be working for you. Those are going to be a little bit more difficult to do. And so it's take it or leave it. So in other words, uh, it's going to be a solution that comes down. The patterns are pretty much going to be set. You're able to configure some of it but it's not going to be able to deal with major surgery. So most AI projects, um, certainly generative AI projects, things I've worked on, may be better off with bespoke types of solutions. In other words, things we custom build uh, based on the exact needs of the system. So we're not trying to uh, bring it down into uh, the way in which your private cloud, your private AI cloud provider is telling you to leverage it. So in other words, the ecosystem and the platforms are built around a problem, you know, not the other way around. And that's normally the way we do generative AI architecture. I don't start picking platforms until I understand the requirements and have done the architecture, at least conceptual architecture. And that's where I, that's when I get to the solution. That's when I start binding physical solutions, actual servers and uh, tooling and all the stuff that's out there. And there's a bunch of stuff uh, out there. It's just an exploding market now into the exact configuration that's going to be provide me with the best optimized architecture. And you're going to find that uh, in some cases that may not be possible. You're able to certainly make it work, um, which is going to be fine. But in many uh, instances, square peg, round hole, uh, if you're not careful. So again, can't stress this enough because, you know, everybody's looking for that one tool that's going to solve their problem. People are always coming up to, to me at conferences and asking me, who's got the best AI? You're not really going to get that answer because you need to carry out a formal requirements gathering effort as part of an AI architecture to really get to your more optimized solution. And you got to remember that AI projects and building AI systems can be three to five times more expensive than traditional environments. So you have to be very careful in terms of uh, your requirements and understanding requirements and then picking a, a, a generative AI architecture, a physical architecture, hardware, things that run on cloud, distributed, heterogeneous systems, whatever you need, um, that's based on those requirements. And it's always going to be different. So it's the it depends answer everybody, everybody hates. But in AI, it's very much it depends. These are complex distributed architectures. They take an awful lot of planning, an awful lot of engineering to get them right, to get them optimized. And it's very important that we get them optimized, considering the fact that if we don't, and we build an unoptimized solution, they could easily uh, cost uh, three or four million dollars more per year uh, than they should. And we're seeing even a lot of cloud solutions have gone that way. In other words, they didn't consider the requirements. They just kind of ran after a particular cloud provider, typically because of the hype. And then now they're force fitting all of their solutions into that cloud provider where in many instances they're not optimized. So in other words, the under-optimization of the application deployment and running things on those platforms, in this case clouds, 
can cost you millions and millions of dollars. And by the way, you'll never see it because everybody will tell you it works. Okay, it does work, but it costs 10 times more than it should uh, to operate those systems. You don't want to be in that boat. There's just too much at risk with the AI stuff. You can just do way more damage than misconfiguration and misarchitecture in cloud computing. Misarchitecture and misconfiguration of AI can get you in trouble quickly. So don't do it. So I am going to look at specific products. Again, I limited my looking at products with those that are able to provide an on-prem only uh, solution. So a lot of the other ones you, you see out there are more hybrid based systems. So even though they do things that are on-prem, such as storing trading data, things like that, they may have or be functionally bound to a, uh, a cloud-based component, something in the public cloud. I didn't look at those because I think that what I'm primarily seeing now, you know, based on my anecdotal information and my clients that are talking to me about this, is they're looking for the on-prem only uh, based solutions. In other words, how do I get to an AI cloud that's going to provide me value, that's able to provide a deployment that only works on-prem? And a lot of them can't. Uh, they have to have a hybrid configuration. Uh, but these are able to run within your data center. And if you disconnected the internet, they should do, be, uh, allow, be allowed to continue to run. So kind of keep that in mind that that's how I limited the analysis. So note there are dozens of solutions out there. Uh, most of them support public cloud only, hybrid-based deployments. Again, do your own research. Uh, it's going to be very important for you to extend your learning you know, outside of this video and which is going to provide you with the ability to get to the exact configuration, the exact architecture that you need. So here's how I evaluated it. So I looked at infrastructure and performance, uh, again, depended on what information was published out there. I did not drag these into a data center and test them and benchmark them. Uh, that's another uh, degree of analysis and I'm not getting paid for this. Uh, so. Uh, if you're going to pick one of these solutions, I urge you to do that. There has to be a show me aspect of this. In other words, I understand you're saying that you provide high performance and you're saying you provide this kind of security, but let's prove it and let's work it in our infrastructure. Let's make sure it works and plays well with other, other systems. So infrastructure and performance, hardware compatibility and optimization, scalability capabilities, ability to scale up and scale down as needed, resource management, very important. So we're managing IO systems, managing memory, in ways that are going to be uh, uh, functionally more optimized. GPU, CPU support and optimization, whether they support both, and most of them do support both processors. GPUs, by the way, have CPUs in them, uh, uh, just spoiler alert. And network performance requirements. The other thing, security and uh, compliance, data sovereignty controls. In other words, if we're doing this because we have a data sovereignty concern, it has to stay within the country. We have the capabilities of doing that directly within the platform access management features, encryption capabilities, audit and logging, compliance certification like HIPAA, GDPR, and then model governance frameworks. In other words, their ability to govern the AI models and uh, also version the models and do all the stuff you have to do uh, to build an AI system. And you know what, how you do AI architecture is a completely you know, different subject matter. We're just looking at this particular narrow focus of a platform. Integration and compatibility, existing infrastructure integration, API compatibility, database integration capability is very important because you have to talk to databases. That's where you get your training data from. And in many cases, you're going to be writing back to those databases directly from your AI systems. Development tool support and container orchestration options. So if we're going to leverage um, you know, microservices and containers, we should have the capability of doing that. Of course, AI capabilities model training capabilities, inference optimization, pre-trained model availability, uh, you know, so like foundational models like Granite and ChatGPT, things like, and Gemini, fine-tuning options, and then MLOps features, the ability to do uh, machine learning operations in such a way where we're able to keep everything up and running, have good observability into those systems, and it's a good consideration because if you're going to be dependent on these AI systems, they start failing on you, and you don't know why, that's a big problem. Also looking at cost considerations, total cost of ownership, hardware requirements, licensing models, they're all over the place. And by the way, one of the things I found out when I was doing research for this, it's very difficult to get consistent information on any of these things. Even on their websites, I would go to a website and part one part of the website would say one thing, another part of the website would say another thing. I left out pricing because I could not get not I could not find consistent pricing for all of these various systems, so you have to ask yourself. What is the pricing? What is the total cost of ownership? How long does it take to manage something like this? How many people do we have to maintain it? And again, if it's going to be on-prem, 
you're going to have to do the maintenance yourself. This is not something you can outsource to a cloud provider. How easy is that to do? How much observability? Is it able to link into your existing operational tools? Licensing models, what you're paying for that, support costs, you know, are they able to answer the phone? Uh, if they're going to, you know, support this stuff, uh, what is the support cost per year you're going to have to pay to get a tech support uh, from your provider to get things fixed? Uh, and which was always kind of funny to me, if you're getting things fixed all the time from the provider, they should kind of do that for free, but I find they don't. Uh, you still require to have a support contract to make those happen. Operational factors, ease of deployment, management interface, technical support quality, documentation availability, training and skills requirements, vendor stability and roadmap, and then finally data management, data pre-processing capabilities, storage optimization, version control, uh, data lineage tracking, backup and recovery and operations, just a few things to consider. Uh, the list goes on further than this, by the way. Again, your particular requirements may have you know, 50, 60 other things that I didn't mention here. And it is going to be dependent on your use case as to how you're going to use it. So I recommend if you're going to do this and evaluate these technologies, that you create a weighted evaluation matrix based on the criteria I just mentioned above. Uh, and that's going to be uh, in the notes. Uh, also aligned with specific organizational needs and priorities, the most important thing. Again, so I should stand up on my chair and tell you that your particular use case is going to be different than what I'm describing here in, is as a general use case. Uh, that's why architecture, architects exist, uh, to take and understand the existing requirements and map them into a functional architecture, which they can map into a hardware configuration or a cloud configuration or a distributed computing configuration, whatever you need. And that's kind of what we're discussing here. So to make things easier, uh, I did provide a table. I'm looking at uh, five different companies here that provide uh, private cloud, AI private clouds uh, that are able to provide with an on-prem only option. So in other words, we're able to run them in the data center and we don't have to be connected up to a back-end cloud system or other systems for that matter. And we'll go through them one, one by one. Uh, Microsoft Azure Stack HCI with AI. Uh, uh, kind of an interesting name. Uh, they provide, of course, uh, integration with Azure services, and they provide Copilot integration. Uh, they provide native Azure. Uh, AI services for on-premise use provide unified management through Azure Portal, enable AI workloads at the edge, and offer a consistent experience between cloud and on-premise providers. And I will talk about how these things are differentiating themselves uh, after we're done looking at each product. Uh, Oracle Private AI Cloud, uh, they do a good job, shocker, with integrating with uh, Oracle Database. Uh, their feature real-time data synchronization capabilities. A lot of this stuff is going to be data-focused with Oracle. Includes OCI, Golden Gate for database replication. That's their tool. Provides AI-powered analytics through Microsoft Fabric integration. Offers specialized database AI optimization. Kind of cool. Uh, supports complex data transformations and migration. And this is according to the information that they're providing out there. Uh, VMware, Private AI, of course, they're run by Broadcom now. Uh, unique partnership with Intel, Mac Series, GPUs, and IBM Watson X integration. We're going to talk about Watson X next, so that's kind of interesting. Built specifically for on-premise premises data protection, leverages existing VMware cloud format, uh, foundation instruction. I suspect it's just built on their existing private cloud infrastructure. Allows direct model training without... Uh, data leaving premises and all these private private clouds offer that. So when they list it as a service, okay, yeah, they all do that. Uh, IBM Watson X Private, uh, they provide an IBM foundational models. I believe that's going to be Granite, but don't you look at do your own research. Built-in governance toolkit for AI workflows integrates with Watson X Data for a specialized data store. Uh, feature domain-specific models for enterprise use. That's kind of interesting because they will have domain-specific models around. Uh, particular verticals like retail, healthcare, things like that. And those are going to be useful if you are building an on-prem based AI deployment because you're going to need those models to augment some of the intelligence systems you have within those models. So in other words, we don't have to go out and train a healthcare LLM about everything related to healthcare in terms of running our business. We're just going to leverage an outside LLM, which by the way, I recommend you do. You're not, you shouldn't be in the business of building specific LLMs and foundation models if you're a typical enterprise. There's almost never a use case I see out there. It's gonna be small language models, agentic deployments, things like that. And finally, Opsin, uh, Watson X Private, they offer pre-trained models with rigorous data perform, uh, provenance. Uh, NVIDIA AI Enterprise, uh, this surprised to me, I didn't know they had a, a solution, they do. 
Uh, deep integration with GPU optimization. Of course, they build GPUs and sell GPUs. They're making bank now because everybody needs feels they need GPUs, and they're getting them from NVIDIA. Uh, includes a complete AI uh, software suite specialized for computer vision and deep learning. Provide enterprise-grade support for AI frameworks, and they're able to they're partnering with uh, VMware for seamless deployment. And I suspect they're using VMware components that NVIDIA doesn't uh, doesn't own. They are they do do a software infrastructure, things like that, but owning a private cloud and maintaining it is gonna be another level of sophistication and chances are they're gonna be leveraging uh, somebody else's product and it looks like VMware is here. Again, do your own research as far as whether that's true or not. So what do they do? What are the unique capabilities? Well, each platform, the way I saw it, you know, has some unique capabilities that really kind of, you know, sets them apart. So what's the one thing that this product does that makes it different from the other products. Well, Microsoft emphasizes Azure service consistency and edge computing, which in other words, if you're a Microsoft shop and you have Azure, you're leveraging the Azure cloud. Uh, you may have a stack uh, that's, running, um, that's running on-prem, uh, which is a, you know, a scaled down version of that. Then this may be a better solution because you have already kind of walked down the aisle with them already. And it's going to be easier since you have the skills to make something like this work. And that's a consideration when you pick some of these things. How many people are walking around the office that have the particular skill sets we're going to need to make this work? Oracle focuses on data integration and analytics. Uh, that should be no surprise to anybody. They're a database company at, at their heart. They're already getting into other areas as well. And so they provide good integration into their own stuff. And they're very data-oriented in how they're deploying these platforms. VMware specializes in infrastructure integration. Uh, IBM concentrates on enterprise governance and specialized models, which is interesting. Again, talk about those verticalized models and your ability to do that. You know, this is not going. This is not an AI show. Uh, we can certainly get into that, and I, I talk about that in my uh, my generative AI architecture class. And then finally, NVIDIA prioritizes GPU optimization and deep learning. Again, no brainer. So in other words, they build GPUs. Uh, the CUDA framework which is the software framework that works around GPUs, and they're able to optimize their own stuff. So uh, no, no, no uh, surprise there. So again, platforms target different enterprise needs, and ultimately, that's what you need to consider. They're going to have a theme in what they do. In other words, they're going to have a definition of a typical client, a typical customer who's going to leverage their stuff. And it's perfectly fine for you to ask them who that client is or who that customer is. In other words, who is this for? And uh, the answer should not be everybody. The answer should be, this is for people who have lots of Oracle, uh, who are looking to extend some of the capabilities and the investments in, in different values in terms of doing AI, or this is for customers that have lots of Microsoft Azure. This is for customers that need uh, verticalized, uh, uh, specialized models, and are able to deploy that because these are you know, built-in integration from these systems. So when you're evaluating these things and you have a salesperson in front of you, this should never be we solve all problems. This should be we have this specific thing that we do better than some of the other folks out there, and we see this as our target customer. Most of them are going to have that definition. Salesmen are a lot more, sales teams are a lot more sophisticated now, and they normally come with sales engineers that are helping them uh, configure the system, but that should be something they're able to provide you with a solid answer on. Well, this was different, <laughs> so don't forget to like and subscribe. Also, don't forget to check out my uh, InfoWorld blog. Also, check out my uh, LinkedIn learning courses. Got a lot of them out there, a lot of AI-related courses, certainly related to um, also private clouds and architecture courses and all kinds of stuff. Enjoy doing those. A lot of content's out there for you guys. And let me know what you think about those. Also, don't forget about my uh, fully mentored uh, course out on GoCloud Careers. We're talking about generative AI architecture and how to make it work. Having a lot of fun out there. I have a lot of people out there who are professions who are in the business and people who are trying to get in the business. And it's really a unique opportunity for us to learn something just beyond, uh, you know, the quick video presentations that are out there now and some of the very, you know, targeted certifications. Also, don't forget my book, An Insider's Guide to Cloud Computing. And don't forget to like, subscribe, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we'll see you next time. You guys be real safe. Cheers.